two and one. And guess what, Jab? We're actually live again. <laughs> we are live. We are live this time. Thank you. It's nice to be live again. Yeah. Or alive. It's nice to be live. Yeah. Never not live. Never not live. Yeah, definitely. Just, uh, you know, get yourself a glass of orange juice and wake up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Some orange juice, plenty of push ups. Never not do push ups. So, yeah, welcome to uh, Q&A episode eight. Uh, thank you for uh, putting up the late start. I mean, I mean, it's typical. Like, we always do the late start. It's always late start for us because that's what we do. And, uh, I mean, right. fashionably late. Fashionably, yes, yes, yes. My hair made me late. It always makes me late, Jab. It's, it's always my hair. You know, my, I'm yep. not late. My hair is late, you know. So that's obviously how it works, right? So uh, this is actually the male version of the Medusa. <laughs> Can't see it, but they're secretly snakes. Can't see it. Yeah, never, never not have uh, snakes in your hair. Apparently, so uh, right. awesome. Uh, glad to uh, see you all uh, joining tonight. I do have a couple announcements before we begin. First and foremost, for those of you who have been waiting, waiting on uh, like when the book list is uh, posted on the website. It's there now. Yes, you can go to csjoseph.life and click on books. Just when you get on the books page, scroll down. Uh, the picture that it's like right in your face, ignore that and just scroll down and then you'll see books. And uh, I also will have posted all of the books that I am currently reading. So if you want to read books uh, that I am reading, uh, definitely uh, get involved with that. I'm actually going to be doing a lecture every now and then doing reviews on some of the books that I, I am reading. Uh, and if you would like to uh, join me uh, for that lecture, for those reviews, you let me know. Uh, the reason why I'm trying to do some reviews is because I really want to uh, offer some uh, advice and some criticism, as well as some psychoanalysis, uh, specifically relating to the authors and what it is they're talking about and what types would actually benefit more or, le or less from the material being presented. And I think that would be very useful for this uh, community. So in order to get involved so that you understand what's going on, I'll probably do those about maybe once or twice a month uh, right now. It just depends on how fast I read the books per se, but I can read books really fast because I average like five books a month. You can check out the book list and just know what I'm reading because I ha that we have that there. Now, uh, scroll down past the essential reading at the very bottom. You'll find the different categories of what books we have. Uh, we are working on the fact that there's like an insane amount of books there because it's literally my library. Yes, I literally uploaded my library. Um, and uh, yes, it looks like it's online store format, but it's all just Amazon. So you just go to Amazon from the uh, the store page and you're good to go. I mean, I'm not actually selling any books off my website. So, and yes, affiliate links because why not? But, you know, just, it's up to you. You can do whatever you want. Uh, so if you want to know what the book list is or what books are available, check them out. Uh, click the books link on uh, my website at csjoseph.life and you're good to go. Uh, and uh, also we're going to be doing a premiere soon on how to social engineer uh, ENFJs, I believe. And uh, also the rest of my GoPro equipment came in. So we're hopefully going to be live streaming from the GoPro very soon uh, instead of, you know, the horrible laptop camera there we go 1080p inbound 1080p and it's like, wait a <laughs> not, not this wait, not, wait, not this potato camera you currently got yeah yeah the potato camera it's like yeah yeah very very fishbowl approach at least the sound isn't as bad as it was before but uh and, yep yes and yes perry annie i did include socionics remember i'm not against socionics except i am against socionics for two for two areas compatibility, compatibility. and oh. how to type that's basically my issues with them everything else is good what's up jeb all right you want to get started in some of these questions yeah let's uh let's definitely uh do that for sure all right so all right, this off. comes from an infp and he asks how can INFP stop being worthless? LOL. How can INFP stop being worthless? Uh, so from an INFP standpoint, you're probably referring to the fact that they're all about how they feel and all about uh, you know what they're comfortable with. 
You just got to keep taking INFPs out of their comfort zone or INFPs need to develop self-discipline and force themselves to do things that they don't want to do. And then through forcing themselves to do things that what they don't want to do, it will slowly expand their horizons and then they will become stronger and they will grow even more. Another strategy to use as an INFP to avoid being worthless and stagnant is to surround yourself with SE users. The higher the SE, the better. Quite frankly, I think like an ESTP, even an ISTP, uh, as well as NFJs, but definitely STPs really benefit INFPs big time and help them develop uh, and get them more out of their dream worlds and more into like reality and uh, expand their horizons of their introverted sensing, help train them, help develop them. And then that way they are more used to things in real life and used to being successful and not afraid of success or afraid of failure per se, uh, because the extroverted sensing functions of STPs especially will really broaden their horizons. Now, am I suggesting that they go to STPs for romantic relationships? I mean, yeah, you could, but they're probably better off with NFJs, to be honest, uh, from that point of view, because the NFJs are going to slightly expand their horizons without taking them out of their comfort zone and maintaining maximum understanding of the INFP. Uh, so that, uh, you know, that can get to that point. Um, so, but yeah, I think that answers that question. Okay. Next question, is it possible to stay in super ego mode for a long time? Like, is it possible for an INTP to use ISFP super ego for his or her artistic purpose positively? Uh, to do what exactly? I mean, okay, so with the super artistic. ego itself, uh, okay, to be artistic, yeah. So I'm going to design this mega hammer used specifically for removing all the people in my life that I don't like. Okay, great. That's that's great. Or um, <laughs> or you were the canvas that I paint upon as I torture you to death. Yay! Yeah, that's 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 really fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's like hey, uh, I just I just I just invented this amazing vice or this really good good uh, this this rack just for you. Or or check out my new state of the art guillotine. <laughs> it's like that's literally like the INTP approach to to the ISFE super ego. Okay, so remember the super <laughs> ego is used to reset your life. That's what it's for. It's the big red button, the nuclear option you press to reset your life to get your life back on track. If you're around people, especially family, for example, or people at work who are disrespecting you, taking advantage of you, treating you like a doormat, as an INTP, you got to get out. So you need to free yourself. So you have to activate your super ego to free yourself from those people and those situations. Now, that's typically how the super ego is used. When an INTP is closer to enlightenment, meaning that they've mastered their unconscious and mastered their subconscious at that point, the superego, they could start experimenting using the superego for positive ways and actually, you know, create art that is not necessarily deadly. But have I, but that's kind of more, I mean, it's not theoretical, but I've never actually observed it myself per se. Right. It's, but I have seen other people use their super egos in super mega positive ways. Uh, here's another example of, um, like a, a super ego, an ISFP super ego used really well. There is this INTP uh, who was driving one time and all of a sudden, because of SE Trickster, he realized he was driving on the wrong side of the street and it was going to get in a head on collisions. And his reaction time went like super mega SE Trickster, ISFP, uh, FI Demon, ISFP, like, like, the road became his canvas, and it was the most beautiful thing you've ever seen to see this guy just weave through traffic as he's driving and uh, like head on with you know other people, and they're like freaking out, and he just has full control over this uh, over this road, and he makes it to safety without hurting anyone, especially like you know himself. Uh, it was amazing to see, and that's just it. Just goes to show you when you get that adrenaline rush, you can actually it can actually throw you into your super ego and use it for like those few seconds. Um, this is something I haven't really talked too much about before, but when you go like when you get an adrenaline rush, we're talking we talk a lot about mind altering substances, right? Putting you into different sides of your mind, right? But 
an adrenaline rush specifically actually has the ability to throw you immediately into your superego, to use the powers of your demon parasite side of your mind, your superego, to actually handle a quick situation, right? Or, or to cause you to brace yourself. Like, so for example, um, you know, uh, a really high, um, gosh, I want to say like, yeah, like, so for, for me, right? Let's say like a, a building is going to explode and I'm in it and there's like fire everywhere. Like I'm, I have normalcy bias because I'm an SI user and I'm not going to react to it very quick. But if there's a situation that I could see happening before it does, and then it does, and I just go, boom, I'm in an adrenaline rush. I go to my ESFP mode. I have super fast reaction time and I can make quick decisions to get out, plot a course, and then somehow meander my way through the dangerous situation. Hopefully my introverted sensing is not in the way. But if it's not in the way as a result of getting an adrenaline rush, it can actually push me into my superego and use it in an emergency situation to basically save my life or potentially someone else's life, depending on the kind of superego. So you got to think about it in that direction. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, a, that's a, a different topic that we haven't talked about. But again, we're going to get to substances in the near future. Uh, I got a bunch of lecture series coming out, so we'll be talking more about that in depth. Okay. Now, this next question is from an INTP. While INTPs are a rare type, there are so many on this Discord and on the internet in general. Could it be a combination of mistyping and the internet being a place where INTPs are comfortable? What types are the most commonly mistyped? And is it related to having a weaker introverted feeling? what kind of INTPs are mistyped and... So, so, no, 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 no. So, why are there so many INTPs on your Discord and the internet in general? Is it because of mistyping or is it because the internet is a place where INTPs are comfortable? And which types are most commonly mistyped? So, the most common INTP mistypes are actually like they're usually INTJs or they're right. ESFJs or they're ENTPs or they're ENTJs, right? Who take the test and they get the INTP result. That's typically how it goes. So they're shadow or the type that the extroverted variant of their type or their subconscious is typically how people test. You know, when you take a test, you get a wrong result. That's how the mistyping works. I think it was Nova that basically said that if you take a test, you have like a 1.5 chance. Your chances of being mistyped are multiplied by 1.5, which is pretty huge, according to like some statistics she saw. I don't remember. And don't quote me on that. I don't exactly know anything about that because I, I didn't read it myself. But uh, the, uh, the likelihood you're going to get mistyped is huge and the amount of people who get mistyped is absolutely huge. Uh, so for an INTP, if you're gonna take, if you really are an INTP, you're gonna take the test, you're probably gonna get those results. Now think about it this way. I took the test and I got INFJ the very first time I took the test. Um, and uh, it was one of the better tests. Now uh, I took the test again and 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 I got INTJ, 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 INTJ till the end of time. And basically I have taken the test probably 20 times and they've all come out INTJ with the exception of the one time it did come out ENTP, which is my actual type. Uh, but that was the most recent time I took the test and that was like four years ago or something like that. It was a while ago. Uh, but I didn't make any of my decisions based on that. It wasn't until I learned interaction styles and temperaments that I was actually able to confirm what my type actually was, right? So, so based on that, um, you just got to be careful. Uh, now, in terms of why there's so many INTPs on the Discord, I think it's because uh, from an INTP standpoint, I might be like one of the few YouTubers, if not the only YouTuber who actually understands INTPs properly and they like that and mm -hmm. they're just congregating here. Now, like you could find INTJ, you could find NTs very easily. They're usually playing online video games, MMORPGs. It just attracts them. And then all of a sudden you have NTs all over the place and NFs all over the place with very few, you know, SJs and few SPs. It's because 
the majority of people that play MMOR, MMORPGs or have a, or are involved in a fandom of some kind or are just generally like an internet citizen uh, per se, uh, you know, then you have a lot of the intuitives because intuitives are more, uh, you know, metaphysical oriented and the internet is a metaphysical realm essentially to these people. So it's very attractive to them. So that's why it attracts INTPs, for example. Uh, and that's just kind of like the, you know, that that's how I would answer that question, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that covers basically all three of them. Um, what types of books should ESTPs read? Any <laughs> particular subjects helpful for the integration of the science of our mind and overcoming our fears and worries? In particular, the gateways in a fear-free and healthy way. Yeah. Okay. Is book one that you need to read as an ESTP is No More Mr. Nice Guy. Like start there, like immediately. Book two, mm -hmm. The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell. Book three, Crush It by Gary Vaynerchuk and Crushing It by Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, also read everything that Robert Greene ever wrote, ever. Like literally all of them. Um, all of which are available on the book list, which is on csjoseph.life. Just click on the books navigation link at the top and then you see all the books even though i said that earlier but anyway yeah those are the books i would recommend you read as an estp um also how to win friends and influence people by dale carnegie and also everything napoleon hill ever wrote and he wrote think and grow rich and uh outwitting the devil now outwitting the devil specifically is very important to an ESTP because it is a book on how to deal with failure. It's a book on failure. It's very important. It's almost as important as Star Wars The Last Jedi. You know, a movie about failure. You know, like the most important part of that entire movie is literally what Yoda says to Luke Skywalker. And in fact, in my opinion, it's probably the most important piece of information to come out of Star Wars ever, out of all the Star Wars films. That whole scene where Yoda visits Luke and gives him some advice. Failure is the greatest mm -hmm. teacher, obviously. That's how you get wisdom. You know what I mean? So as an ESTP, mm -hmm. it's very important that you gain wisdom as much as possible. Why? Because it develops your sage, your INFJ uh, subconscious. It develops your sage. And to do this, you have to gain wisdom to develop your sage. So if you're going to develop your subconscious, you need to gain wisdom as much as possible. Wisdom is everything to the ESTP. And then you exert that wisdom upon others and improve other people. And just like we found out in season 16, episode four, which was about the inferior function, that NI inferior of the ESTP, when it can when it goes into the INFJ subconscious, it actually has the ability to outdo the hero which means the INFJ subconscious actually has the ability to outdo the INFJ ego. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Your subconscious has the capability when you're in full aspirational mode to actually outperform someone who has that type as their ego. Whew. So be aware of that. That's because people, when they're in their ego, they have normalcy bias. They don't know, they're not using it for the best possible practical application. So be right. aware of that, you know. Speaking of the subconscious, perfect segue moment. Segway. This question comes, comes from an INTP. Hi, at the end of your Swift video, you mentioned that due to her high level of success and inferior function integration, she developed her unconscious more than her shadow. Can you uh, elaborate on how this would? Sorry, she, the, sorry, I heard unconscious. Your subconscious versus her shadow. Right. She developed her unconscious more than her shadow. Sorry, yeah, subconscious more than her shadow. Can you elaborate on how this would affect a person develop? Can you explain how this would affect a person's development in their twenties or thirties? How would this be manifested, and how is it likely to be caused? So someone in their 20s or 30s and how to start developing their subconscious, is that the question? No, the question is relating to how you mentioned that Taylor Swift had superior subconscious development because of her success. Right. And this person wants you to elaborate on how this would affect the person's development in their 20s or 30s. 
how would this be manifested and how is it likely to be caused? So what causes someone to develop their subconscious okay, in their 20s so, or 30s? And how does this manifest? What can you see? Okay, so I'm going to answer that question in like a roundabout way. So imagine like an Olympic athlete, like a, a gymnast and a, a female gymnast who gets a gold medal at 14, 15 years old, 16 years old, something like that. They're a teenager, right? And they've spent their whole life so far training to have that opportunity. Their subconscious is super developed as a result of that because their subconscious is very expert sensing focus. So it could be like an INFJ, right? An INFJ female uh, performing or an INTJ female even uh, performing uh, gymnastics and they're really developing their subconscious to that end. However, because their subconscious is so really well developed, their shadow is not as well developed. Now, people typically develop their shadows as a result of suffering, pain. It's just pain. Whereas people develop their subconscious through aspiration, right? So since the majority mm -hmm. of people feel pain all the time in their life, they end up developing their shadow first, their, your unconscious side of your mind, because it's very pain-oriented. And it is the more immature part of your soul, as it were. So to help really deal with, you know, and gain maturity and even develop your parent function, as you develop your parent function, you're developing your, uh, your shadow pretty well because as your parent develops, so also does your critic uh, by, by proxy, right? Now, when you're developing your, uh, when, you, when you've developed your subconscious per se, your parent function doesn't necessarily develop as well. And thus your shadow is not as developed as well. So you're actually kind of at risk of being less mature because you suffered less pain in life. And think about it. We've seen this typically with Taylor Swift all the time. How many times have we heard about her crazy breakups, right? Or how, oh, she broke up that guy. That means she's going to write a song about him. You know what I mean? Like we know that she does this and she does this because her shadow is not really well developed because she has not felt as much pain as people who do have their shadows developed. But those people who have their shadows developed don't exactly have their subconscious developed as much, right? So you have to kind of pick your poison. The point is, is that you have to develop both. If your shadow is not as developed because your subconscious is super developed at an early age, then you're still going to have to go through life suffering pain and having failures over and over again for you to actually develop your parent function, to be able to develop your critic function, which will, you know, and help you, and then also develop your other functions to get your shadow where it needs to be, right? Mm -hmm. So it's situations like that uh, that you need to be aware of. So like Taylor Swift, that's why she, everyone looks at her and they're like, wow, you're like really immature. There's a reason for that. She hasn't suffered as much pain to be able to develop the maturity that she needs to because she's been so subconscious focused. She's not as shadow focused, right? Like most of us are because we suffer more pain that way. That doesn't mean she's right. better than us. It doesn't mean that we're inferior to her. It just means we're different. And the battles that we had to fight in childhood are the battles that she has to fight in midlife basically. And right. it's just whatever, uh, uh, it's just whatever is, you know, kind of available at that point in time. You know, everyone's got to develop the sides of their mind. Eventually you don't have a choice. It will happen. You have to. And in fact, if you don't develop your mind will make you develop, it will cause a midlife crisis. And if you further Further avoid that, you'll develop symptoms of psychosis, quite frankly, because the brain, mm -hmm. the mind demands, the human soul demands self-actualization. It will get it from you one way or another, even right. if it has to destroy your life for you. It will get it. So just make sure so, that... So you, going back... Yeah? Yeah. So going back to that point on people who don't have as much pain in their life and they more so develop their subconscious... Is an extreme example of immaturity with subconscious development that of, say, rich kids who are given everything and haven't felt pain and then all their life is success, all their success is handed to them? 
Paris is that Hilton a good example? Much, Nicole Richie much? Right. Like in that reality exactly. TV show that they had that for some reason my parents enjoyed watching <laughs> <laughs> right after Survivor. Oh, those were the days. <laughs> I mean, is that a good example of immaturity of people who are subconscious focused? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, people who have developed their subconscious are typically more immature later in life, but eventually they'll get there. Uh, eventually they get right. there. Now you also have to look at it this way. Uh, look at it from concrete uh, types versus abstract types, sensing versus intuitive. Sensors, they start off having really great athletic success early in age. And then as they get older, they're not even remotely athletic at all. Intuitives, it's the other way around. They're really bad at athletics at an early age, but as they get older, they become really amazing at, at athletics. You see what I'm saying? Because they're developing their sensing based subconscious. So there's a lot of different caveats to uh, type development and calling the functional development, you know, to be aware of. But, uh, but yeah, just understand like the subconscious has really nothing to do with maturity. Um, whereas, uh, you know, people say, oh yeah, the ego is, is the most mature side of your, of your mind. Yeah, sure. It is. But if you want to make it more mature, you need to spend time maturing your shadow because vicariously your ego will be more mature as a result. And you only do that through suffering, suffering pain. You have to understand that here's the whole meaning of life. Yes, the meaning of life according to C.S. Joseph, which is you're here on this planet to suffer and feel pain. That's a fact. That is why you exist. You are here on this planet to suffer. The reason why is because suffering brings wisdom and development and growth. Because the only proof of life that exists, and I'm quoting somebody when I say this, is growth. Without growth, there is no life. That's It's death. So like when someone becomes a vampire, they stop growing, right? I'm like so quoting like the Vampire Diaries or uh, or Twilight when I say that. But, uh, but the point is they stop growing. There's no growth. They're literally stagnant. They're literally dead, right? There is no proof of life without growth, right? We are here to suffer and become diamonds. Yes, you can listen to like, cue up the Rihanna song, diamonds while you're at it. Just kidding. Uh, but, uh, but again, diamonds are perfectly flawed. Human beings are perfectly flawed. Diamonds are created through pressure, pain, heat, et cetera, that whole model that I've talked about before. So remember, that is why we exist as human beings. So we have to develop our shadow as a result of pain, which gives us wisdom to be able to continue onto the path of enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? Enlightenment is just taking the four sides of the mind and integrating them together and becoming an integrated human being with all four sides of your mind. That's literally what enlightenment is, having full harmonious integration, etc. That's how I'd answer that question. Oh, it looks like we got mm -hmm. a super chat, Jab. All right, do you want me to read it? Uh, yeah, sure. Does depression plunge you into your shadow and do antidepressants block out access to the shadow while exaggerating access to the subconscious? Well, that's a super dope question. Awesome. Thumbs up on that one. Yeah, the answer is yes, actually. Yes. Um, this is why I'm very <laughs> anti antidepressants. I'm very against those uh, psychiatric drugs for sure. Anti uh, antidepressants can do that. Um, for example, like uh, like if I'm on a stimulant, right? Uh, stimulants really typically put you in your subconscious, and it, and if you're on stimulants over time, like a huge overtime, you end up underdeveloping your shadow, and you are at risk of be, when you're coming off those antidepressants, especially in adulthood. You are like, say, you were on antidepressants in your young adulthood, like when you're in adolescence, and then you come out of. Um, uh, you know, you, you come off your antidepressants, say when you're like 26 or whatever, your shadow is going to be somewhat underdeveloped and you're at risk of being more immature, you know, as a young adult or even later in life, depending on your maturity levels. So yes, antidepressants definitely stunt cognitive growth. Be very careful when you use them instead of like, mm -hmm. you know, and I know there's, there's a lot of people that struggle with depression. I'm like, what are you going to do about it? Right? Like I get it. It's a problem, but and, you know, the thing is, though, is that this is why it's important to like to bring the fathers back because fatherlessness is contributing to depression in a big way. You know, uh, there's some people that would argue that against me on that point. But I mean, I get I get their points and I understand. But like I'm talking collectively here, not on an individual case by case basis. Right. So 
because I'm holding fathers to a super high standard when I say that, you know, um, and, uh, uh, Victoria Pollock, I just want to, I saw your question. I kind of put that, add that to Would caffeine still be considered a stunter. It can, uh, caffeine has a lot of problems with it. Like, especially in women, uh, caffeine, for example, stunts women's ability to produce testosterone, for example. And, uh, that can be a serious problem. Uh, Caffeine, uh, when I, when I, when I drink coffee, uh, I end up, I end up going into my ISFJ, uh, subconscious and I get like super behind the scenes when I have caffeine. But when I have a lot of caffeine and I mean a lot, my ISFJ subconscious starts to bleed into my super ego. Uh, and I could be like really, really animated as a result. It's not really so much my shadow. Like my shadow is more of like when I take a depressant instead of a, a stimulant. But again, this changes. Um, and it changes because it also has to determine, you know, what your brain chemistry is because your brain chemistry, you know, what if you're taking antidepressants and combining that with caffeine? What if there's alcohol in there? What if there's marijuana in there? Like the whole myriad of uh, substances that uh, people put in their bodies simultaneously really changes the story. So does that mean that I can have like some binary answer for you? Not necessarily. So there's just, mm -hmm. there, it's just a lot there. And there's, there, there needs to be more research done in terms of, uh, you know, consuming mind altering substances and what it does to your mind, but we're just not there yet. I'm sure someone uh, in this community will take on that project and, and make it happen. Um, or I'll get to it eventually, but but not right now. <laughs> so. Yeah, if anyone wants to give us a grant, we can do the research. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but I just want to bring bring us back to that. So you talk about so the question itself was about how antidepressants prevent you from slipping into your shadow, which actually makes it more difficult. Hey, I, I have a call right now. Um, I'll be right back. All right, cool. So uh, for those of you that don't know why Jab is actually answering his phone during the stream, it's like it's like something career-oriented. Yes. So hopefully it's good news. So uh, all right. Let's kind of figure out where are – how do you talk without moving your mouth? Um I will answer that question, crinkle cut porch junkies. Uh, how do I talk about moving my mouth? I talk without moving my mouth because this is such a really terrible camera and uh, it's just not that great. <laughs> I'm actually gonna scroll up here. All right. When is the online test you're creating to become available? It will be available soon. I'll, I'll admit what happened was is that uh, I had some finances uh, set up for its development and it was being developed, but I had some financial hard times and uh, basically all of that money that was earmarked for the development of the test to be made available on the website and as a mobile application, uh, it based that project was basically put on hold due to financial concerns. Uh, so Mr. or Jordan Spike, uh, that's, that's why, uh, the test is not out yet. I am hoping to have it released before the end of the year. So thank you all for your patience on that. It's definitely, uh, coming, uh, Medusa's type. I have no idea. Uh, key giveaways that someone is an INFP versus an INTP. Uh, I will be talking about this in probably the last or second to last episode of, uh, season 10. Um, are you back, Jeb? Yeah, I'm back. Awesome. All right. All right, let's just go to the next question because cool. I forgot where I was at. So how can finish through types get better at starting stuff? Finisher types? How, okay, so how can finisher types uh, start things? Oh, that's a, that's a doozy. Um, it has to really, start. really mean something to them. It has to be like an experiment. Mm -hmm. Uh, something I've noticed about uh, people of direct responding movement interaction style and the way they interact with anything, people or otherwise, is that um, it probably, it really has to, it has to really, really mean something to them or they're trying to figure something out through trial and error. Uh, there has to be an end goal, right? And it usually, like for example, an ISTP when they're building something, right? 
uh, it's usually something that they've been thinking about for a long time, or it's a problem they're trying to solve. Finisher types out of all of the types are very problem solving oriented, more than the in charge types, aka the structure types, more than uh, the background types. Definitely finishers are very focused on solving problems. So really, they just have to identify existing problems to solve them. It's especially easy for um, the uh, INTJ and INFJ and the ISTP. The ISTJ doesn't really have to seek problems. The ISTJ is just surrounded by like, ooh, the physical environment. And uh, well, there's problems everywhere. You know, kind of like an ESTJ looks at the physical environment and then to the ESTJ, it's like, wow, the entire environment is nothing but pure chaos. I must put it into order, right? It's a similar experience to the ISTJ. It's just that to them, they're just so triggered by how their environment makes them so uncomfortable that they have to fix things. And that's generally how finishers actually start things on their own. Now, do I recommend, uh, you know, if they're trying to start something entrepreneurial and whatnot, maybe they need to have a starter type come up to them with a problem or like be like, Oh, I have this amazing idea for a business or, or whatever else, you know, but I can't do it by myself. It's a problem. Help me solve this problem. And then the finisher types like, yes, I'm in. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, superpowers activate. And then they, they, they finish the starters uh, thing and solve that problem. So it, it goes, um, it goes pretty good uh, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I think that covers it. So let's go on to the next question. Awesome. What are the reasons for future-based types like INFJs talking about the past? For example, telling stories of when they were a child. What is the reason? They're usually trying, like an INFJ doing it, they're usually trying to draw an example to try to improve another human being. They're trying to help somebody when they're doing it. I have suffered so much in the same way you have, but here is how I tried to fix the problem after I realized what I could do about it. And you should do it too. You should do it the way I did it because I was able to get out of it. And I want to tell you how you should do it. Right. That's, that's kind of how they go about it. They're usually, they're usually telling a story for someone else's benefit or they're telling the story specifically to harm somebody else, but it's always about someone else. They're not really telling a story for their own edification. That's more of an introverted censoring approach. But remember an INFJ is an extroverted censor. They're trying to give someone an experience. So they're telling a story. They're literally trying to etch that person's soul basically uh, with that story to cause that person to be obligated to change in a positive way. That's basically where it is. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just basically, I went through something similar to you is what you can draw from it. Yep. All right. So next question is, which types are the most prone to being attention whores? <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um <laughs> SE, NF, strong SEs? NFJs and STPs, that quadra the most, for sure. <laughs> that quadra, absolutely the most, because it comes from this cockiness. They're like the show-off types, STPs and NFJs, all about being show-offs. And they like being mm -hmm. the center of attention that way. Now, stereotypically, because I'm not really pro-stereotypes with the, when it comes to each type, which for some reason many people in this audience think I am all about stereotypes, but actually I'm not. If you would watch each playlist specifically for each type, not really you know, that much. And then it's like, ooh, yeah, I'm an ENTP. And then all of a sudden I tell people that Kanye West is an ENTP and they freak out for some reason. Like, okay, am I really all about the stereotypes? But the point is... Uh, the Quadra, the STP and the NFJs, for sure. They're, they're show-offs. They're the most cocky of all the types, absolute cocky. Um, uh, they are the ones at the highest risk of being conceited and arrogant, um, although one could uh, could uh, could say that TI heroes and parents could actually are the most uh, arrogant of all the types, which I would actually agree with that as well from that point of view. But in, but in terms of like getting attention, 
it's from that point. Now the ESFP, everyone's like, oh yeah, the ESFP, you know, that they, they're they're attention whores, you know, like no, they're not actually. They're not. They want to give people a good experience, sure, and they want people to think highly of them, but that doesn't necessarily make them uh, an attention or, or someone who's trying to show off. It's just that they assume that because, you know, oh, they're the big party ammo, they, they, they might be an ESFP. Like, no, that stereotype was created from people on the MBTI forums or the INTJ forums or whatever location where people were still typing people with the, the letter dichotomies. It's like, oh, that guy's extroverted. And he's obviously sensing, and he's such a feeler, and he's really, really a perceiving type, I could tell. And it's just like, wow, actually, no, he's really an ESTJ, but for some reason, you know, you just, you guys just don't realize that he's drunk right now in his ISTP shadow when you should be using interaction styles and the temperaments to type this person. Yeah, no, the stereotype is not like a real thing. Like, seriously. ESFPs, not necessarily how it is. But if you look at an ENFJ, by comparison, it's very different, right? Because the ENFJ is all about making everyone feel good. They want to get that recognition from other people. They want to give people that amazing experience. My own father does this, for example. Every year, about uh, twice, every six months, he hosts a shootout at his house where all of his friends come out with various tables and they stick guns everywhere. And uh, my cousin takes uh, old uh, furnaces and other debris, throws it out in this huge field, and uh, we make more debris and just completely de obliterate everything. Uh, it's really fun uh, when I had the opportunity to do that. I haven't done that in a while. Uh, but the point is, is that every person uh, that's out there, my father is right there as an ENFJ, making sure everyone is comfortable, everyone is safe. Uh, he likes making a big noise because that SE child wants to give everyone a big experience. It's very show offy, somewhat cocky in certain cases. Uh, he's always has to promote himself, the mentor, and teach other people to shoot consistently, etc. But uh, not necessarily, um, not not necessarily a, uh, a you know a, a problem per se. So. Um, mm -hmm. That's how I answer that question. Right. Um, <clears throat> for some reason, I think I've skipped over this question. If I've already asked you it, just tell okay. me next and I'll go next. So you said in earlier videos that one can use their shadow function by getting over their worry nemesis. In what scenarios can one use shadow functions manifest both positively and negatively? Yeah, we, we already answered that question. Sorry. For some yeah. reason, I thought we skipped that. It's all good. All right. Now... This is a bit of a uh, personal question. How tall are you, Mr. C.S. Joseph? <laughs> I am five feet, ten and a half inches tall. Oh, my. All right, what are you talking about? Uh, if I was over six feet, if I was just, just over six feet, I'd make $10,000 more a year statistically. <laughs> my dad always says that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get some stilts. West of my heels. Built. I know, right? <laughs> nice, Perry. Annie. All right, nice. next. Next question. What causes a person to be locked in their unconscious, and how could you get someone else or yourself out of it? Okay, so um, get them away from their pain and suffering for a little bit, and get them away from the source of the pain and suffering and abuse and trauma in their life, or teach them how to get them out of it. Like, teach a man a fish, don't just give a man a fish, right? And by doing mm -hmm. that, they'll start to come out of their shadow and start to make their own decisions. Now, this typically happens, the most common way to do it, uh, because it's the most common issues is that it's, it's children having problems with their families and their families are abusive to them. Uh, and what people mm -hmm. consider as abuse is different from what I consider as abuse. Because remember, we talked about in season uh, 16, episode three, the child function, child abuse is a thing. People just don't know that they're abusing other people's child. They just don't know, right? And uh, if this person is being abused or if their parents are the same quadra or older siblings is, is in the same quadra as them, there's going to be conflict from a social compatibility standpoint. We're going to throw them in their shadow, which means they're going to be consistently in shadow. They need to get away from their family. So they grow up. They become an adult. They can finally have the power after hopefully they have a job and a car and their own place, I hope, and they can get away from their family. They actually could be their own person. 
right? And at that point that they are their own person, they can actually pull themselves out of their uh, out of their shadow and actually be in their ego for once. That happened to me, except it took till I was twenty six, which <laughs> sucked. But it is. Uh, what it is. Okay, um, I will take that as the cue to move on to the next question. And I lost where I was on the page. Give me one second. Don't fire me, please. I can just answer a YouTube question for now. Fair enough. That's what I'll do. Scrolling up. Doesn't the big five try to use the scientific method to which I would respond? Doesn't the big five not to know the difference between uh, nature versus nurture? And as a result of not knowing that <laughs> difference, it is lacking in value as a trustworthy system. That's kind of my wow. answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, wow. I'm not a fan of Hexaco. I'm not a fan of Big Five. I'm just not. Uh, I don't think they adequately uh, uh, map out human nature versus nurture properly in the same way that uh, I have a problem with Enneagram in that same way as well. There's just no real defined or definitive way of uh, differentiating the two. So that's just kind of my my concern on that standpoint, yeah, for sure. Okay, all right, I'm back where I am. Cool. Next question is: What is a quick way for a person in conversation to notice if they're being forced into this unslash subconscious? Well, are they afraid or are they worried? That's, I mean, <laughs> are are they being coerced? Right? If they're being coerced, there's there's a there's that that's it basically. Am I being right. coerced? Am I being coerced? But is, couldn't you realistically tell if you're being more introverted or more extroverted? Because both the subconscious and shadow are the opposite in terms of extroversion and introversion. Wouldn't you be able to see that difference if you really tried to notice it? Kind of. I mean, it, it just depends on how much force is being exerted by the third party or the other person, basically. And through that, right. uh, otherwise you're just going to bleed into the other sides of your mind, given the situation. Because remember, the ego will try to solve the problem on its own. If it can't solve the problem, it'll go to usually go to the shadow, unless that person is more subconscious developed, and then it will go to the subconscious to try to solve the problem. And then it will go to mm -hmm. the shadow after that. And if all three of those fail it will either have to look for help for another human being. Oh, there's no help from other human beings. Time to use the super ego. That's basically right. the entire process. Yeah. All right. This next question, which types are most likely to develop all four sides of the mind the earliest? None. None. It's, it's, it's each end I mean, everyone's nurture is different. It's an individual basis. Yeah. That's not, that's not something we can quantify. Okay. Just go on to the next question then. <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> Do you think our subconscious is the mask that we put up to the world when we are not confident enough with our ego? No, that's our shadow, actually. By and large, it's our shadow. We go into our shadow for that standpoint. I mean, that's what I had to do as a child. My parents didn't mm -hmm. like me being an ENTP, so I had to go INTJ mode. And they're able to handle my my horribly morally principled INTJ shadow uh, because my ego right. is not really allowed to exist in that in my family. So, mm -hmm. this next question: Which types multitask most effectively? <laughs> Expert intuition heroes and parents, for sure. So NTPs and NFPs are the best multitaskers, hands down. No one can out multitask them. Well, I don't expect you to answer for every type, but what is an example of each type feeding their demon? Ah, an example of every type feeding their demon. <laughs> just give a few. Okay. Um, well, don't even do it by type. Just do it by cognitive function. Um, that would be like an ENFJ using TE demon and an ESFJ using TE demon together. Uh, they would be like super cruel mocking people, labeling people, things that are untrue, but very clever enough that it hurts them to the core. That's like a TE mm -hmm. demon. 
or calling to question someone's intelligence in a very, very provocative and negative way and is in public and completely dresses them down um, on a whim, almost to the point of being spiteful. Speaking of spite, my SE demon just loves to light things on fire. It loves to um, be as spiteful as possible and just, just, just walking by someone and making their day absolutely horrible for no reason. Uh, like I, I knew that I had that problem, and as an outlet with for SE Demon, I would play online video games. And what I would do in MMORPGs back when I was addicted to World of Warcraft, for example, which destroyed my life, and I don't recommend that. Um, all mm -hmm. I would do, I wouldn't even go on raids. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything. All I would do is wait for this stupid quest called Dangerously Delicious uh, to force people to go to the PvP zone, and I would just hide in the bushes waiting for people to pull up their fishing <laughs> rods and fish and I would kill them while they're fishing and do it over and over and over again and I would camp them and they'd scream at me and get so angry and I'd do this for hours and hours and hours every single day collecting their tears as they're complaining about me killing them over and over and over while they're peacefully fishing <laughs> and I would be merciless to those people that's an example of me feeding my demon right torturing okay. people <laughs> in that horrible way <laughs> so just Cur just on my own curiosity, I'm going to hijack this question and make it my own question. What does NI Demon look like? NI Demon. Um, so, NI Demon just uh, only wants what it wants. And if it wants to screw something over, it's going to. Like, it's just, that's all it's going to do. Like, um, they're like, oh, you don't want me to have that experience? Oh, I was worried about giving you that experience. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you that experience anymore, but I want to anyway, you know? And it's right. just like, it's like having this constant desire to harm fellow human beings for no reason whatsoever. But it's usually from the point of view of being poetic, poetic justice. All right. Poetic justice is everything to an I demon. Absolutely everything to it, especially like to an ISTJ. Poetic justice with that INFJ demon. Um, mm -hmm. How they punish their fellow human beings who have harmed them in whatever way, right? It just turns yeah. into this, like, yeah, it's it's very poetic, uh, meaningful in that way. So, Right. I mean, the reason why I was trying to ask that is because... I think I've brought it up to you before, but I've been trying to type a character from a certain uh, anime out of my own curiosity based on how interesting they are. And I'm thinking, well, I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about because I think I've spoken about you, about him to you before, the character from the uh, the Iron-Blooded Orphans Gundam series, Mikazuki. Yeah. I was always thinking, like, is that an E demon? Is that an I demon? Because what he wants seems to be what everyone else wants, but it seems to be blind. And and almost like demonic in a sense. Well, uh, blind faith. It really yeah. comes down to blind faith. He's putting his faith into something because it's the only thing that he understands, right? right. His interaction style is still background. So definitely, Ni Demon. It it really blinds the faith of the SI hero. This is what causes ISFJs to check their heads at the door, their brains at the door when they're going to church and listening to a preacher from a pulpit tell them how to live their life. And then they enforce everyone else in their life to live by that standard that they've been preached from instead of actually okay. using their TI child and criticizing everything the preacher has said. It's akin to that. Right. Uh, with regards to what Perry Annie said, fictional characters don't experience human organics, so you can't say they're a certain type. That is 3,000% correct. However, good writers can still accidentally portray types correctly. And some and some writers actually uh, have been trained in Jungian analytical psychology through the use of tropes. And uh, because of archetype tropes, which is based on Jungian analytical psychology, they can actually write specific to type as a result of that uh, method. And I have seen that happen consistently. And in my personal experience, this is me personally experiencing it, uh, having known a few authors who write fiction, uh, the types that are able to do that the best 
are the world building types uh, in terms of writing fiction, and those are INTPs and INFPs. Uh, they are very masterful in their ability to do that. The George R. R. Martins of the world, for example. Mm -hmm. so. Anyway, enough about me hijacking questions. Let's let's move forward. Well, we got um, uh, we got a uh, super chat, so let's let's read it. What are the first three right. things, tips that come to mind when you think of social engineering INFJs? Can I jumpstart that video? <laughs> oh no, no, you can't jumpstart that video. <laughs> No, no, uh, <laughs> but I will answer give a the little question. Bit. I'll, I'll give a little bit. I'll, I'll give a not little even bit. some crumbs. Come on, Hansel and Gretel. Okay, okay. You mean Little Red Riding Hood? Come on, man. Get no, right. Hansel and Gretel, the ones that left the crumbs in the forest. Okay, I think that was Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, well, apparently I'm wrong with my fables. Uh, they left candy. Okay, thank you, Jose Santana. Awesome. Uh, social engineering INFJs. Um, I will I will mention one thing uh, because I actually have mentioned it before, and it has to do with their SE inferior. If you want to take away an INFJ's performance anxiety away, so let's say for example, um, uh, you were about to have a bedroom experience with an INFJ. The thing is, is that they have that performance anxiety, uh, and it is it, it it that performance anxiety inhibits them to be comfortable enough in a bedroom situation, right? So, in order to make that INFJ comfortable, you have to ahead of time preface the bedroom experience. So, before it even happens, you have to basically tell them that you make me the most comfortable person in the world, and list reasons, and list specific mm -hmm. events that they have done in your relationship to cause them to know the truth that what you're saying is true, that, you know, they always give you a good experience. They always make you comfortable so that they understand that it's basically impossible for them to give you a bad experience in the bedroom. And then as a result of that, they all of a sudden they're super comfortable and it becomes an amazing bedroom experience as a result. Right? So that's one mm -hmm. way I would put it to answer that question for sure. All right. Well, on that note, let's move to the next question. Uh oh, don't tell me I lost where we were. <laughs> All right, quickly answer some uh, YouTube questions. I don't know why, but something keeps scrolling me off where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, just use multiple pins just in case. Right on. Just, uh... yeah, I keep finding it. All right, I think I'm here now. So awesome. what would what would you say is the appropriate logic for attempting to learn the type grid by heart? So is there a rationale behind your type grid which will allow learning it easier, be easier to a non-SI user? Yeah, learn interaction styles first. Um, there's actually a third component to the uh, type grid that I haven't talked about yet, and that's going to be a season uh probably season 17, I don't know, or it might be its own season, uh, but there's uh, there's actually a third method for how to type people that I haven't talked about yet at all, and it's gonna be great. Uh, so yeah, learn the interaction styles first, every time. If you need help learning interaction style, literally get all these books. Like seriously, get, get these books, and they're on like my website. Wow, I am such a shill. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> No, seriously, get those books. Learn the interaction styles. Uh, Dr. Linda Behrens, learn the interaction styles first. After that, you want to learn the temperaments. And if you need to read a book on figuring that out, get this one, uh, People Patterns by Stephen Montgomery, to learn the temperament matrix. Linda Behrens, Stephen Montgomery method, great. And there's a third method that I am going to be adding page three to the type grid very soon. That third method will be the third way that you could utilize in typing someone. And it's super mega accurate and it's super easy and it's really great. Uh, and I have talked about it before with some people, especially people on coaching sessions. That third uh, page will be done after we release that season, which will be either during season 17 or after season 17. <laughs> haven't decided yet, but we're getting there. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Of up? the 20, however, something seasons we actually have, how many of them have we actually finished? <laughs> we finished every season except for season 10, season 14. Uh, season 20 is a forever season. Uh, as season uh, 
21 is not finished yet. So we haven't finished 10, 14, and 21, but all of the others are done so far. Okay. Yeah. Could have sworn they were like, only seasons one and two were done, but whatever. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway. No, not true. <laughs> What's next, Jab? What's next? All right. Is there anything we in the CSJ community can do to help you put out more and higher quality videos every week? Uh, teach me how to use GoPros properly. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, teach me how to understand uh, proper quality audio uh, and uh, understand <laughs> virtual audio cable, like not like a, not a moron. Uh, uh, help me. Uh, or fly Jabba's my... ass out so he can babysit Chase. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, the babysitter. Okay, okay. Um, oh, we got a we got a, a super chat request. Uh, yeah. The sock. ISFJ versus. ISFJ Sorry. versus INTP. Advice for INTP: Have kid. Things aren't good. We we broke up. Okay. Um. Wow. Uh, if you're an INTP, I don't know the specifics of that relationship. So because I don't know the specifics of that, um, are you trying to get back together with the person? Like, what's the goal? Like, I don't, I don't understand what the goal is there. So I was hoping Mr. Uh, Sock Reglius could actually say something in the chat. Please give me some additional context there so I can answer this question properly. He's probably like typing super fast, as fast as I can, you know, or he can. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what are the, well, maybe we can start off with what the typical problems are in an ISFJ and right. GP relationship. We'll do that. Strategies for that. Yep, that's that's why I got Jab, you know, to babysit me. <laughs> okay. Um, so to keep a good relationship, uh, honestly, uh, that kind of relationship is not really going to be good because – the ISFJ is going to expect the INTP is giving them a good experience at all times. The ISFJ is going to expect the INTP is making them comfortable at all times. I'm sorry, but INTP is making people comfortable. I'm just going to have to burst out in laughter at that. INTPs don't make anyone comfortable. It's not their job to make people comfortable, but it's the number one need of the ISFJ to, make, to be made comfy. But there's nothing about the INTP that makes an ISFJ comfy. Why? Because they have SE Trickster. SE Trickster is not capable of making SI Hero comfortable or feeling safe or feeling secure, right? There's no, so basically the INTP then is cursed to keep the ISFJ in a state of fear for the entire relationship. Yeah, that's healthy, right? That's healthy. No, it's not healthy. It's uh, not something I recommend. So, so an INTP basically, I, I would not uh, recommend uh, – um, <sighs> hold on. Has he responded in chat yet? Not really. Keep oh, a good relationship, is. basically. But um, the point is, how are you going to make that ISFJ feel comfortable? It's their number one need. I mean, you, it's so hard. You have to, like – Focus all of your mental energy, everything you have, every cognitive function you have specifically to shove out just a teensy amount of SE because the INTP is so focused on what they want in terms of their experience, focusing on their comfort. Their mind is predisposed to care about their comfort, not the comfort of another human being. I'm sorry. And the ISFJ doesn't need to be made to feel good. The ISFJ is trying to make the INTP feel good all day long but the INTP doesn't care about how they feel. So explain to me how that's going to be a good thing. Explain to me how that's going to make sense. It's not going to work. It's not a sustainable relationship. I'm, I gotta be honest, you know, if you're in a bad relationship in a difficult relationship with an actual ISFJ and there is no mistypes, if there's absolutely no mistypes there, then I would recommend ending that relationship. Why? Well, I remember this INTP who was in a similar situation with an ESFJ where the ESFJ was like, Oh wow. This ESFJ actually became physically violent with their ISFP shadow and would beat this INTP with a broom on a regular basis. It's a former coworker of mine. It was, it was pretty rough. Um, I even have photos of the bruises of him that he wasn't even going to like defend himself, but I took photos of those bruises and uh, we put it, you know, in his file at HR in case 
we needed those, you know, for whatever legal situation that could come as a result of that for his own safety, etc. because he was going maximum doormat mode, like most INTPs do in that situation, being married to an SFJ, right? And the SFJ basically walked all over the guy and he wouldn't do anything because he was too afraid of leaving the relationship because of what it might do to the children, right? Because that SI child loyalty, right? That got that doormat going, right? Let me tell you something. If you're an INTP and you're in a marriage with an SJ, specifically an SFJ, and you're staying in the marriage for the kids, you are a horrible person. Yes, you are a bad yeah. person by doing that. And let me tell Whoa. you why. Let me tell you why. The reason why is because you are teaching your children to make the same mistakes you are doing. You are allowing the SFJ to disrespect you and be, and you are becoming a doormat. So you are teaching your children that it is okay to be a doormat. It is better for you as an INTP to basically end the relationship, right? And, you know, if you're like, if you're like the father of the children in that situation, you know, raise those children without that SFJ in your life, because then by the time they come of age, they'll actually like respect you and have self-respect. See, that's more useful instead of staying in the relationship and being a doormat and teaching your children through your example as their father to be a doormat because you're too much of a nice guy, right? When you should be reading like Nor, Mr. Nice Guy, which was written by an NTP, by the way, by Dr. Robert Glover, and realize that you being nice is only actually causing more damage because there's nothing nice about nice guys. They're not nice, actually. They're manipulative. Covert contracting, which is actually very typical of INTPs because their ESFJ subconscious has to covert contract everything, especially when they're in those codependent relationships with SFJs. It's not healthy. So if you are staying in the relationship specifically because of the children, you're harming your children, which is why I get to say you're a bad person. Wow. That's a fact. Stop harming the children. I think that's a bit... I think that's a bit extreme. I think. Uh, oh yeah, gotta love that SC demon extreme extremity. But I mean, I, I'm sorry, TI parent. It's a fact. I'm I'm not here to make people feel good. I'm here to tell the truth. I'm sorry if people don't like right. it, but it's just it's the way it is. Now, speaking right. about INTPs, uh, you know, uh, speaking about INTP specifically when it comes to children, um, by being that example and by bettering yourself. It's better for you to be outside that, that relationship, focus on not being a nice guy, better yourself, esteem yourself. If you don't know what that means, you need to watch season four, six, and 13. Those three seasons, they are playlists on the YouTube channel. Read those. Learn the four pillars of self-intimacy. Learn how intimate relationships actually work and how they're based on love and respect, etc. Uh, learn about the, the mature genders, uh, the, fem the mature feminine, the mature masculine, how that actually works right? Mechanically. And then esteem yourself as a man. And then doing so causes respect to happen, uh, you know, by the SFJ, hopefully, you know, it, it's probably not going to statistically, it's not going to. So you're kind of better off your own and being a better example is a better father as a parent, right? That is more useful. That is way more useful, uh, you know, for, uh, for your children, because, you had self-respect and you left, right? And then they will have self-respect because you did. Because guess what? You're not teaching them to be the doormat, which typically happens when INTPs are staying in relationships with SFJs for the sake of the children. You're actually harming your children in the end. So that's how I would answer right. that question. Yeah. I mean, I would somewhat agree with that sentiment. Do not risk how your children can grow up in order to try and make a relationship work. I mean, you could probably be a far better, better. You could probably be a far better father outside of that household than you could being a doormat and constantly upset and constantly depressed in that household. Because well said, you may actually, you may actually take that out on your children if you're upset all the time. Eventually, maybe not now, but can you really say that you won't take out? that depression and frustration on your children in 15 years time where you're, you know, you're, you, you may beat them. You may uh, can over consume alcohol in front of them, which would set a precedence of, Oh, becoming an alcoholic. So, okay. No, 
no, it's not. But yeah, essentially, I agree with Chase to an extent. I think he's being a bit harsh, but that's SE Demon for you. Yeah, and I on am, that note, I'm harsh on SE Demon. But thank we thankfully we have Fi Child on the uh, live stream here uh, to right. babysit Chase. <laughs> exactly. Jesus. <laughs> Chase. Chase needs a babysitter. Yep. Need That's a my babysitter. Job. Yep. Yep. Also, thank you to Isaac for the ten dollar. The ten dollar. Yeah. I feel like a stripper right now, having ten dollars yep, thrown yep. at me. Yes. Yes. Jab is definitely coin operated. Just so you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a slot in my buttocks. Oh my. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't get on me about going all extreme. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go back. Prone to having anger issues. And before SE. Uh, yeah, it's SE, SE users. Um, uh, it depends. Every type has anger issues or potentially anger issues. It's just that SI users hold grudges and they build up like a bubbly cauldron inside, inside and then they explode like a nuke. Whereas uh, an SE user is, when they get angry, it's pretty explosive, but it's a smaller explosion. And it's just a series of small explosions is their anger. Whereas the SI user there's like nothing, and then all of a sudden, at random, giant explosion, boom. That's that's how anger works. And SI users are not as forgiving, uh, and uh, they hold grudges, and they can become vengeful. SE users, not so much. SE users don't have as many regrets as SI users do. SI users carry regret with them everywhere they go, every single day. It's something they deal with. SE users, not so much, mm -hmm. because they can easily just forget and just because it's not happening right now, it's not real to them right now. Whereas the SI users, those regrets are real to them every moment of every day, right? So how they approach anger is a little bit different, et cetera. Whee! All right, next question. What is the ultimate purpose for FI parent other than needing to feel good? Can you expand on what you discussed and what is the cognitive attitude of the parent function? Okay. Yes, I will admit that I give FI Parent a lot of crap. That's what I do, apparently. I give them a lot of crap. But uh, the thing is, um, FI Parent actually can be really, really useful in some ways. Um, actually, a lot of ways. Uh, they are so... I Actually, um, an ENFP friend of mine, really good friend of mine, uh, he's one of the reasons why I'm actually here tonight. Uh, really good, good gentleman. Um, he was selfish and depraved for so long, but he had some really bad things happen to him in his life, including going to federal prison. Uh, and uh, he's not in federal prison anymore, changed his life. And he's a very charitable human being, one of the most charitable people I've ever met. Uh, I, I can't believe how charitable he is. And uh, he's always thinking about other people and being, you know, going out of his way to be as good as possible. But if I parent, he had this, he had this one story um, where he was actually being manipulated, uh, financially manipulated, coerced by his so-called friends at one point in time uh, to give up money for a certain cause or something. And he's like, I don't deserve this. If I parent really is aware of what it deserves more than anyone else. And in fact, it's so well aware of what it deserves um, that other people, like when it looks at what other people with uh, with its FE critic, with the FE critic of the shadow of the ENFP, they're very aware of what other people deserve because they're always keeping score. That's one thing about ENFPs with FI parent. They are always keeping score with people. And because they're keeping score, they're definitely going to be, uh, you know, again, that little poetic justice of their INFJ shadow, right? Uh, that could be an issue. Uh, so if I parent, it does know what it deserves. Now, the thing is, though, what it believes it deserves, it's, it's still based on a belief. It's not actually a fact. 
And you and I, Jab, we've been around FI parents who these people have been insanely selfish. They've been trying to take advantage of us. They just believe these random things. They start rumors about us. Uh, they they destroy mm -hmm. our reputation because they're afraid of their reputation being destroyed. So they know that their reputation being destroyed is the way to hurt them. So they hurt other people through destroying their reputations and spreading rumors and changing the thoughts of other people, manipulating the thoughts. It's literal thought manipulation, right? But FI parent, when mm -hmm. they are mature and it's really well developed and it's not just them doing N-E-T-E -E or S-E-T-E, -E, when FI parent is actually really um, matured, it has this super high, sharp uh, moral principles, these super high principles that has super good, quick decision-making in terms of what is a good or a bad thing. And they're able to weigh it out in their head. And FI parent, it's most use is being able to have the super precise valuation. They can literally value things properly. Uh, and that especially goes with finance. If you want someone, to, if you want to know if something is really valuable or not, take it to an FI parent. They'll tell you exactly if something is valuable. They, they're really good at finance. FI heroes are also insanely good at finance as a result because these people, FI heroes and parents, they know exactly the value of things and they could tell you exactly what the value of things are. TE heroes, TE parents, not as much actually. So it, it becomes an FI hero and FI parent strength, especially when the, these people are aspiring with TE inferior for the FI heroes or uh, when, when TE child is being directly engaged in a positive way instead of a selfish way, uh, they really have the ability to just weigh things out in their head. And it's really fascinating and it's super useful. This is one of the reasons why when an ENFP is being charitable with their virtue from their FI parent, you know that they are being literally the best of us. They can be the worst of us with their insane selfishness, but they actually have the capacity to, be, to literally be the best of us because no one can out charitable them. No one can out give them. And when they're giving, they're giving properly because they understand the exact value of things and they know the value of what they're giving, right? A great example of this would be Gary Vaynerchuk. Probably the most advanced ENFP I've ever met. His FI parent is super mega developed. Uh, his moral standard is something that I can't even like, wow, it's, it's unbelievable. His moral standard. Yeah. He's got a mouth on him, but his moral standard really goes beyond that. And he understands the real value of things. And as an FI trickster, I've had the opportunity to learn from his FI parent and try to kind of engage, you know, the value of things properly, especially when it comes to my relationship with this audience. Right. Uh, it, it, it's super, it's super important. Um, so, so yeah, that, that is the, that is the true value of FI parent. That is its true, uh, uh abilities of what it can do. Um, this is, its value system is kind of second to none because it's the highest function that's pessimistic, right? Uh, they really know they actually know the value of things, but remember, because you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So because they know the true value of things, when they're trying to shyst you, that means they're way more responsible than anyone else because they really know what value they're actually giving you. They really know deep down in their heart if they are screwing you or not, even though they would claim that they don't because TE, TE child, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Cool. Uh, right, just, me, uh, just... just a few more minutes and we're, uh, we're going to be closing up. So let's keep going. We reckon two more, three more. Two or three more, yeah. One more? Yeah, all right. So do you have any advice on how an INFP can limit the high need and crave for status in himself and others if it's having a negative impact on life other than actually trying to acquire it, which seems like a never-ending letter? I don't think they should eliminate that need at all. It is a very valid need to be popular and regarded by and respected by other human beings so that they can feel good about themselves. I think they should seek to fulfill that need, just not in a negative way, in a positive way. And they do this through contributing and mm. seriously do it through contributing. I, it's going to sound weird, but I have the hardest time convincing INFPs to do volunteer work. It's the weirdest thing to me, but I I've coached a lot of uh, INFPs uh, and 
they're like, they, they, they always ask me, okay, well, how can I get an NFJ man? How can I get, uh, you, know, you know what I mean? And it's usually INFP women that I'm coaching and they always ask me, how do I get an NF, NFJ husband? And I'm like, this is how you do it. Volunteer work. You go volunteer because it's usually the the organization or the or whoever's running the event for the volunteer work itself. It's ran by an NFJ man. Typically, it almost always is ran by an NFJ man. And they'll see the INFB and they'll just be drawn to her. You know what I mean? But convincing yeah. them to actually do that, it's so hard. But if they really want people to think highly of them, they have to learn to give. You, give and it shall be given to you. I'm sounding churchy now when I talk about the law of the harvest. Ooh, voodoo, right? But uh, All right. but it's it, that, that principle, it's a principle. It's an FI principle. Give and it shall be given to you. That is an FI principle. And no one understands it better than NFPs. Uh, ISFPs and ESFPs, not as much because they're so focused on what's happening right now. But when it comes to SFPs, all they have to do is just build stuff for other people, make things, make things for other people or, or contribute, give other people a good experience, make art or give them or entertain them or something like that. Give them a good experience. Whereas the NFPs, they just need to give, right? And that's it. That's, that's how they get people to think highly of them and in a healthy way. Just give back. Just give, right? Give their deepest gift. This is why David Data wrote The Way of the Superior Man. He talks about people giving away their deepest gift. If you have not read that book yet, read that book, The Way of the Superior Man. It's on the book list on, on csjoseph.life. Uh, there's a books link. Uh, you can find all the, the books there. Um, I'm a shill. Uh, but anyway, you know, like it's – that's that's how I would uh, answer that question, you know. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Next question is: Are ISTPs or ESTPs less self-aware? And in brackets, taking into account reflection, social awareness, and impact on others. Yes. Yes. The answer is yes. Yes, they are. They are less self-aware. Yes. In fact, they're probably <laughs> the least self-aware of all the types. Yes. Absolutely. The reason is because they don't have introverted sensing in their top four and they don't have FI in the top four. They're so uh -huh. externally focused, focused on how everyone feels and how in the physical environment that they're not really as self-aware. And because of that lack of self-awareness, they have a hard time uh, trying to figure things out on their own. And they usually have to bounce ideas off of somebody else in order for them to make a decision or to be motivated to do something or for them to feel free uh -huh. enough to do something. This is also why those uh -huh. types like to exert a bunch, a huge amount of control on fellow human beings just to guarantee that they have the freedom to do whatever they want. It is a need they have. Mm -hmm. That's why they are built to be with S SJs, specifically STJs, because STJs have no problem being controlled in that way, per se, knowing that as long as the STPs have full freedom in the world, that those STPs will always come back to them and actually want them. Because all an STJ wants is to be wanted. They just want to be desired. And they know that, hey, you can have all the freedom in the world as long as you freely choose to desire me. I'm cool. So, um, okay. There's a, uh, there's a question in the YouTube uh, chat. I would like to answer Jab, if that's cool. Yeah, go for it. <sighs> so Raylan asks, what does Mr. ISTJ like to hear most from someone? And out of curiosity, what does ENTP want to hear? <sighs> So uh, what does Mr. ISTJ like to hear from someone else? They want to hear, um, they want to hear this. I think highly of you because of X, Y, Z reasons. You're a good person because of X, Y, Z reasons. I want you. I desire you. I have passion for you. I always want to make you comfortable. I always want to give you a good experience. I always want you to be safe. Mm -hmm. I want you to always feel secure. I want you, you know, I appreciate all of your hard work into making this house as comfortable as possible. Thank you for cleaning. Thank you for being clean. Thank you for being well-dressed. You know, those types of things. That's right. what I would say. To an ENTP, uh, to an ENTP, uh, I would say, um, um, First and foremost, ENTPs, like the top needs of the ENTP, the first need that they need is to be trusted because ENTPs oh. have this problem uh, where they just look untrustworthy. So people just don't trust them and they're judged by 
like a book on its cover. Their second need is uh, to be met is um, um, to be understood because no one really understands ENTPs. They don't. And people that actually try and do are insanely rare. And because of that, they feel very alone. And because of that, they go in their ISFJ subconscious and social situations and look like they're introverted, even though they're not, right? Uh, and it's this interesting uh, dichotomy. Uh, always tell the ENTP that you want them, that you desire them, that you have passion for them. ENTPs need to hear because that, because ENTPs always want to be wanted, right? Always ask ENTPs what they think on literally everything because the ENTPs will tell you the truth, even if you don't like to hear it, kind of like me spazzing out earlier about INTPs with SFJs and children, et cetera, right? Spaz out, uh, tell them the truth. Always tell the ENTP that you value them. Always tell them that you value your ENTP uh, and, and prove it. Give them recognition. They actually deserve recognition because they're constantly thinking about you at all times, especially in a relationship with them. Uh, oh my! About your well-being. Yes, Jeb. You and I. You know, Hawaii, <laughs> you know, some champagne. Call it good, right? Uh, my babysitter. Uh, and then uh, also <laughs> seek to make your ENTP as comfortable as possible, but also. Every now and then make your ENTP uncomfortable if they're growing stagnant. Sometimes they just kind of need to get, you know, their head in the right direction and off their butt so that they actually produce, et cetera. And uh, yes, thank you, Periani. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Um, so yes, yeah, see, that was like my Effie child getting lit up for y'all right now. That's literally what happened. Gotta love that FI parent. <laughs> um, so, uh, great. Um, yeah, so that's how I'd answer that question. Uh, what's what's next, Jab? Let's do a, one or two more. All right. This question is 85. Well, this is from a while ago when you had 8,500 subscribers, but it's 8,500 subscribers predicting 10,000 by Thanksgiving. When is the book coming out? Uh, the book will be coming out probably Q1 next year. Next. <laughs> uh, next. Can you do a season on how each type feeds a healthy superego? Uh, yes, I, I am getting to that. That's going to be my series on enlightenment. Um, but yeah, uh, next question. Can someone be in their shadow permanently and have it become their ego? How do you know you're not in your shadow? No. Newbie, don't know if you've answered this already. No, I have not answered that already. No, your, your shadow cannot permanently be your ego. You'll just get stuck in your shadow. But eventually, once the sources of pain and trauma and suffering in your life are removed, you'll go back into your ego. The super ego, however, can become a permanent fixture. And you can actually switch between your ego and your super ego in the same way that we saw Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker. He's an ENTP stuck in his ESFP super ego using the chaotic evil trope through writing, etc. Um that's kind of that that approach. Um, so uh, based on that, uh, yes, the superego, uh, remember the superego exists to claw its way to the ego and replace the position of the ego. That's what the superego desires more than anything else, which is important to reach integration. So the superego kind of actually reaches that state without it being a violent thing and actually destroying your mind and destroying your life in the process, AKA succumbing to sin nature or uh, the human condition according to religious circles that's kind of that direction right uh so no uh or hold on uh so the super ego you know it's trying to get and replace ego martin luther said the self bends in on the self i said that many times before uh but uh it's it's the same concept the super ego can replace it now we have seen in like car injuries people switch to different areas in the quadra that they're in we have seen that and like they come out like a different personality, but that's like super crazy trauma. And we don't exactly know how that works, but I'm going to be exploring that a little bit more in season 17, which is coming out very soon. Uh, and we'll be talking about that more in depth. So, all right, Jeb, Bye. um, I got, um, um, at rising tides question says, uh, so I guess we INTPs have to study lots of philosophies and understand what we value. The answer to that question is no, but that would, it would be a yes question for INFPs for sure. 
Um, one more question, Jab, and I think that's it for the night. Okay. Let's just take one from YouTube. All right. Um, you choose. You choose. Come on. Let me pick one. I feel like we're playing the lottery right now. Playing the lottery. So got, uh, with, with, with obviously like Raylan's NI parent, just like, I'm going to spam you with my SE child until you answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> Worked out for her, I guess. What is... Yeah, I guess. What is the best way to type children? It seems it would be difficult, a difficult task to get through answers. I'm thinking of about 10 and under. Okay. I want you to ask me a different question. I, that question is answered succinctly in season 17. I, I will be right. talking about um, that directly. Let's see what we got. <laughs> Uh, it's a mess. Who cares? Which, I'm going which back type to is most likely to have <laughs> trust issues? Athens. Let's do that one. Which All type right. is most likely um, to have trust issues? What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. NJs. Yes, NJs are the types most likely to have trust issues. Yes, NJs. And the reason why, extroverted sensing child from ENTJs and ENFJs, and extroverted sensing inferior from INTJs and INFJs need loyalty more than anything. And INJs specifically more than anyone else crave and absolutely have to have loyalty in order to function in life, especially in close relationships, intimate relationships. It is required for them. So without the loyalty that they need for their SE inferiors, they're just like, you know, so because of that, they have trust issues with people because they're constantly trying to figure out who's loyal to them and who's not. And they're at risk of jumping to conclusions using their expert intuition nemesis or the critic for ENJs and jump to conclusions that, uh, you know, their partner or the people close to them or their closest friends are valuing other people more than they are. And that, and if they don't, they don't like uh, being, you know, betrayed, especially when usually INJs and ENJs and Js in general, <laughs> work so hard to give these people, you know, SI users, a really good experience so that those people's souls are etched and those people will always remember them and never forget them. It is the greatest fear of an INTJ and an INFJ, for example, that they would be abandoned or that someone would betray them even worse or that they would be forgotten. It's the greatest fear. They don't want to be forgotten, right? So because of that, you got to be aware of that. It's a need of them. And what that does is it creates potential trust issues. And that's where you get NJ paranoia from with the INTJ being the worst, which is why it's the INTJ vice, even though they all have a paranoia uh, issue. But it's worst with INTJs, right? And it comes from expert intuition nemesis combined with extroverted sensing inferior, right? Which we'll talk more about in season 16, episode five. So... All right, Jeb. I think uh, I think that does it. Yeah. Well, on that note, thanks for all for coming. Is there any reason that my comments are getting? I didn't notice that. Your comments. Um. Yeah. Th thanks for that. Thanks for coming. Had fun. Again next week. Uh, we got enough questions for next week. Uh, Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So as we close the episode, just remember, uh, folks, uh, if you want to get your questions in, I know we got a bunch of questions on YouTube. Uh, we, we read off the questions from the Discord server. So if you want to get on the Discord server, go to any of the lectures on the YouTube, click the link, the Discord link, okay? And you can get on Discord, and then you find the Q&A channel in our Discord server and put your question in there, and that's where we're reading off the questions, okay? We will read some YouTube questions, of course, and every single time if someone puts up a super chat, for example, if someone puts a super chat up, we will stop what we're doing, and we will answer their question, of course, uh, if anyone wants to fast track their question to the top of the heap. But otherwise, the questions are in the Discord server. Join the Discord server. Ask your question. We will get to it. We skip a few questions every now and then uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason I'm not going to mention. Uh, the other reason is if we're actually, if I'm actually going to be talking about the answer to that question in a very near future lecture. If it's a lecture that's way far out there, I'll answer the question. 
or if I've already answered that question, I'll answer the question, of course, no problem. But just understand that's kind of how our format works. And we're definitely going to get there and we're going to get to it. So join the Discord to get that advantage. Also, um, if you want to copy the type grid without potentially giving me your email on the front page of my website, you can also get it from the Discord at any time. Just do the command uh, exclamation point type grid, one word, enter, and then boom, the type grid will randomly appear for you to use. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, we'll have that all available at your fingertips and whatnot. And uh, we're constantly growing the Discord server. We're actually going to be adding some... Uh, uh, new channels to it soon. Uh, I have yet to talk to the mod team about that, but uh, we'll kind of see how it goes. Of course, it might double the size of the channels in the Discord, and Jab may come after me with a broom, but that's another discussion for a later night, of course. So, oh, anyway. I wouldn't come after you with a broom. Oh, but no, only an axe. <laughs> oh, only an axe. <next. laughs> oh, uh, I would like to say um, for that, for Raylan, of course, who's complaining about your phone number, we don't see your phone number. The phone number is just used for verification. We don't collect your phone numbers. All the phone numbers are there. The reason we had to take the phone numbers is because we're having people harass our members on the Discord server. And when we ban those people, that phone number is banned, which means they can never come back, right? Otherwise, they were able to just come back over and over, over again. It was a security issue, Raylan. So we're not actually taking your phone number. And... Uh, Discord isn't doing anything. They can't do anything about that legally anywhere because you'd have to actually opt in to allow calls and uh, it doesn't do that at all. It doesn't give you the choice. So I don't see your phone number. No one sees your phone number and that's all there is to it. So please join the Discord server. Um, anyway, I think that's it for me, Jab. You got anything else to add? I think we're good here. No, thanks all for coming. Uh, remember to, if you are interested in buying one of the books Chase is reading, uh, they're in the book section on his website and the book list and Keep what I'm mind, currently you, reading. Yeah. And what he's currently reading. If you do buy through the website, the affiliate link will give me five cents, which I will steal from chase. He, so, will. Uh, he, he is coin operated. <laughs> I am coin operated. So every five cent piece we get through the affiliate link <laughs> will be uh, deposited directly in me. <laughs> And on that night, good night, people. Dude, all right, good night. <laughs> <laughs>